Okay, guys, and welcome to the 504. I'm Sheba Turk, and as we all know, early voting is underway for the November 18th elections, which means the big runoff for mayor. Only two women are left standing, City Councilwoman Latoya Cantrell and former Municipal Court Judge Desiree Charbonnet. First off, thank you ladies so much for being thank here you. tonight. It's just a beautiful sight really to look at the screen and see that we will have a woman mayor. Yes. We don't know which one yet. What does that mean to you guys? Did you even think about that when you got into this process? <laughs> uh, definitely uh, not running to be the first of anything, but uh, it truly is an honor to have gone through a process with 18 of us, uh, you know, vying for mayor and ending up with uh, two African-American women. So change is definitely coming to the city of New Orleans. It's taken 300 years, and I'm just glad to be here. Most certainly. Mm -hmm. And Judge Charbonnet, tell us what that mm -hmm. means to you. Oh, it's exciting. It, it's uh it's an honor, it's a privilege to have been born and raised here and have the opportunity to be the city's first woman mayor. You know, we didn't talk about the whole woman topic uh, aspect of it during the primary, but it has come to the forefront now since um, the reality is here. And uh, I think it's very exciting for everyone. You know, I find men and women alike are embracing this idea and recognizing that a woman at the helm will definitely put a new face on the administration in the city, but also, you know, a woman looks out for certain interests in, in different ways and gets things done in different ways. Yeah, certainly. And it is kind of great, right, that in the beginning, the woman part wasn't part of the conversation. It's just we got qualified candidates and mm -hmm. it happened to be two women who came out on top. All right, so let's mm -hmm. get into some of the issues. I really want to talk about young people as we start tonight, because recently Gambit ran an article saying that lots of young people had come to New Orleans after Katrina. They were so excited for economic opportunities and really found that housing was extremely expensive sure. and there weren't as many high paying jobs that they thought there would be. So Councilwoman Control, mm -hmm. I want to know how you're going to bring more opportunity for young people and young people who live here. Well, one is that we have to definitely play to our strengths with the eight colleges and universities we have and two medical schools and a link them to the industries that are here and that are growing here. Uh, one is now we were 58% of the startups in the country were in the city of New Orleans and a lot had to do with these young people coming here setting up shop so the ability to help them scale up is really where the rubber meets the road right now they've been able to start up but now it's scale providing access to capital that can move that forward. In addition to that is linking them again to opportunities that are growing here in terms of industry. Uh, the health industry here, biomedical, technology, renewable energy platforms, uh, stormwater management, uh, engineering department at UNO has just started, but we need to help scale that up as well so that we're connecting our people not just to that, that educational opportunity, but to that wage that is aligned or with their experience. And so these industries are here. We just have to scale them up and make sure that our people are connected to them and, and really propel the growth um, of our young people. Affordability, as you mentioned, is an issue. Mm -hmm. It's the highest that it's ever been to live in our city. And it's not just with those who've come here in the post-Katrina environment, but people who've lived here pre-Katrina as well. And so um, we have to incentivize affordability. We have to provide soft second options, gap financing options, uh, moderate rents as well, working with our landlord community. Uh, but really using our housing trust fund the way that it is intended. And that's mm -hmm. why I work very hard to save that housing fund. And Judge Charbonnet, I want you to weigh in there. How mm -hmm. will you make young people have more opportunities in this Well, city? we need to diversify this economy, right? So we have young people coming here um, trying to start up new businesses. However, you know, we need to make sure that we are bringing the support that they need. I also want to bring companies here that will serve their needs, that they are qualified to want to mm -hmm. work for. So you know, we've got this brain trust here. We've got people coming out of the universities around this whole city really every six months. So we've got to market that brain trust we have here. We cannot afford to lose it, but we've got to make sure that we're bringing the jobs here that are the new emerging industries that will support these young people so that they can afford to live wherever they want. But we've got to support them. We've got to bring these businesses here, but we've got to make sure um, we can give them incentives that's necessary. So we'd have to look into using the Economic Development Trust to uh, lure those industries here and also give them the incentives that would bring them here. You know, there's a lot of opportunity in this town for bringing businesses here. There's lots of areas that could use a shot in the arm, like New Orleans East. There's parts of Algiers, the Lower Ninth Ward. Mm -hmm. Let's encourage them to go in those areas so that we can bring those people up. 
All right, when we talked about affordability, there was a big report that came out last week. You guys may have seen Huffington Post and The Lens put out this report mm -hmm. saying that Airbnb was causing mm -hmm. neighborhoods to get richer and whiter even faster. So basically speeding mm -hmm. up gentrification. I should say that Airbnb is saying that necessarily is not the impact that they think they're having. Judge Sherman, I'm going to start with you on this one. Mm -hmm. What do you feel like Airbnb is doing for the city? Do you feel like it's a disservice to locals and what do you plan to do with it? I think this we've got to look at it in a balanced approach. We have to be sure that we're preserving our neighborhoods, but still allowing some development where that's concerned. The biggest concern I hear from a lot of residents, mothers and fathers in single dwelling areas, zone single family, is that they don't like the idea of different people in their neighborhoods or next door to them weekend after weekend, mm -hmm. uh, not knowing who they are and their children playing outside and having concerns for their safety. So you've got to address those issues. So my proposal was to have only one per block in residential areas, a little more flexibility in the more commercially zoned areas. Um, you know, when you think about what's happened in this community and, you know, gentrification is, is it's, it's a word that has so much impact. We, we used to have a natural musician's village that was Treme. Mm -hmm. And now we are actually looking to create musician's villages for affordable housing um, for, for, our, for our musicians in this town and, uh, and entertainers. And it just seems like something's just wrong with that picture. We should preserve the neighborhoods while having some balance. Um, but yes, lots of people are saying, you know, I can't afford to pay my property taxes anymore because there are three Airbnbs in my neighborhood and now that's caused my property uh, value to go up. So we've got we've to have a more balanced approach, but I'll close with this. We need to bring both sides together and have a good, hearty conversation about it so we can come to some, some agreement and strike an agreement to that yeah. effect. And Councilwoman Cantrell, I want you to weigh in because you hear from both mm -hmm. sides on this. You hear from locals who were actually able to save their properties mm -hmm. because they put it on Airbnb and took in the extra money. You hear from locals who complain because they're next door. How do you sure. kind of find a balance? Well, I mean, I've been in the trenches of this, mm -hmm. uh, pushing for regulations uh, because there were no regulations in right. place and no enforcement at all. So you cannot put the genie back into the bottle. Mm -hmm. We're a destination city. This has been a problem long time. Regulations are important. We have over 5,000 permitted short-term rentals in the city. Mm -hmm. uh, the housing plan calls for 30,000 units that need to be placed on the market to ensure affordability. So clearly the 5,000, it's an issue, but it's not the affordable housing crisis that we're in. In order to create balance, you have to meet people where they are. Not every neighborhood is the same. Mm -hmm. Some neighborhoods welcome the short-term rental, some do not, whether it's the Bywater and the like, or Broadmoor, for example. But the French Quarter right now, when we, we are still not at a year yet, but what we've seen in the past six months, you have more units on the market in the French Quarter than ever before. They can't rent those units. They're not picking them up. And so many of the owners are now selling them because they can't rent them, nor can they do short-term rental. Mm. And it's caused um, um, a real problem in uh, areas outside of the French Quarter that are taking on uh, that burden. So whether that is Treme, whether that is Bywater. So there has to be greater flexibility as we revisit this. I would say let it play out for one year, do a thorough analysis of where we are, work with the current New Orleans City Council as well as the council that will be forthcoming because these decisions are made at the legislative uh, level. And so I've recently put forth some legislation to uh, change some of the historic urban mixed use uh, that by right could have short-term rentals 365 days. Well, in this particular community of Uptown, well, that was a problem for them. So we work together. You have to listen and you have to build consensus. And we created a win-win just a couple of weeks ago as related to more pressure coming into the lower garden district. So this is not something that you can do a cookie cutter mm -hmm. approach with. It has to be specific to the neighborhood because our fabrics are different. And you have to engage the people who live there. You know, the neighborhood residents are the world's greatest experts on where they live. Mm -hmm. And these decisions cannot be made without them at the table. But I do believe that with balance, with uh, in, uh, being very intentional and providing gap financing options and other options to help stabilize the neighborhood, redevelopment is not gentrification, 
but without being intentional about how we are incentivizing the balance, mm -hmm. it can quickly move into gentrifying communities. Gotcha. And that's something that we do not want. I wish we could talk about a lot more tonight. We are out of time, so I just want you guys to leave voters if they go into the polls and are still undecided. When they think Councilwoman Latoya Cantrell, why should I vote? Give me a quick thought. Well, Councilwoman Cantrell has been a leader in this community, taking on and living every single quality of life issue, been in the forefront of affordable housing, economic development, neighborhood stabilization, both as a councilwoman, but as a community leader and executive leader. I have been able to listen, build consensus, and deliver results. That's my track record. I get things done and mm -hmm. I want to do more for our city. All right, Judge Desiree Charbonnet, when they walk in there, what should they think? You should vote for me because I have a proven record of leadership in this community. For the last 20 years, I've been elected serving you, first as your recorder of mortgages and then as a judge at municipal court, where I created programs for diversion to help those with mentally, mental illness, um, drug addiction, human trafficking, and those prove results. But bigger than that, my commitment to you has been unwavering. I stepped down from the bench to run for this job. I love this city. I love its citizens, citizens even more, and I am prepared to do this job. You've gotten results with me. I know how to run public offices. It is what I have been doing for the last 20 years. I'm accountable, I'm transparent, and I'm trustworthy. Well, thank you, ladies, so much for being here tonight. I really appreciate it. And whoever is the next mayor of New Orleans, you're both welcome back on our show, but we'd okay. love to have the first female mayor on the show Very as well. Thank, Thank you, you ladies, much. we really appreciate it. Well guys, no matter what happens on the 18th, we know that New Orleans will have its first woman mayor. And tonight we've got five reasons to get excited about a lady taking the top spot in New Orleans.